Crossroads, it's great to be with you. Let's hear a shout out for those of you in the room. Ah, no, I don't believe you. Let's do it again. One, two, three. And for you online, hey, welcome. It's great to be with you today. Hey, I want to remind all of us, Crossroads is a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church committed to making disciples of the next generation. Translated that this is a safe place for anybody to pursue truth and to pursue God. And we're beginning a brand new series today called, Does the Church Care? And a little spoiler alert, yes it does because God cares for you. Regardless of your backstory, regardless of where you come from, that there's hope for all of us. Hey, if you're new to us, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, if you would like to take that step, you can text the word new to 720-513-1933. Uh, that's all I've got, but we're gonna begin our morning celebrating the goodness of God. So in the house, if you'll stand together and uh, let's get after it, here we go.
can go ahead and be seated. What a way to start our time together. I want to welcome you this morning. Welcome to those of you who are here in-house. Welcome to those of you who are engaging digitally online. If we have not met, my name is Chris, one of the pastors here. And uh, man, I'm excited for this weekend because today we are kicking off a four-week series about care. And uh, we're, we're, we're calling this series, Does the Church Care? Uh, because chances are there's people in this room right now, and there's people who, who are watching online or listening online. Chances are there's several of us where our world is just upside down right now. Right? Several of us where, where something's happened, and anxiety has come your way, something is just not right, something is keeping you up at night, a relationship is broken, plans have fallen through, Something in your life may be totally upside down right now. And at some point, for all of us here, you've probably asked the question, does the church care? Maybe you asked that question recently, like today or this morning, which actually brought you here. And if that's the case, man, I am so glad that you are here today because in short, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, the church cares. Uh, but we're not that perfect at it. We're not that great at it all the time, are we? In fact, for some of you, the answer to that question might be no. Because I remember a time in my life when I was suffering or going through pain or everything fell upside down and, and I looked around and nobody was there. And maybe that caused you to, to doubt or to even question God. And if that's been your experience, man, I really am deeply sorry for that because that's not what God intended for the church. What God actually intended for the church is that the church should be the most caring group of people on the planet. That's the big idea over the course of this series is that the church, who's the church? Followers of Jesus, people who have placed their faith in Jesus, Christians should be the most caring group of people on the planet. You know, we look around and we see a lot of people who, who care in a lot of great ways. And all of that should pale in comparison to the way the church cares for people. That's what God wants to see. And so we're doing this series because we realize that we continually need to be turned back toward this idea. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the topics of suffering. Today, we're going to be looking at suffering. What does it mean to suffer well? What does it mean to understand suffering and pain and hardship through a biblical lens? Next week, we're going to be looking at this idea of comfort. What does it mean for God to comfort us in our pain? Week three is where we're going to get real practical, and we're going to be talking about your part. How do you, as part of the church, as a follower of Jesus, uh, practically and realistically care for those around you? And then finally, week four, we're going to be looking at how God heals us and even delivers us in our times of pain. And so today we're going to be kicking this off by talking about suffering, which I just have to start by saying suffering's kind of a weird word. It's a word that we all know and, and we know what it means, but it, it's not something that we use in our everyday language. When was the last time someone came up to you and, you and said, hey, how you doing? And you're like, oh man, I'm just suffering, <laughs> right? I mean, we just don't use it like that. But when I say that word, just so you know, when I say the word suffering, I'm using it as just a generic general term. That, that includes all kinds of pain and hardship and anxieties and even fears and regrets, whatever it might be that, that has turned your, li your life upside down. It can come in many forms, can't it? Suffering can just come out of the blue. It can come for different reasons. It can come from our own choices. It can come from other people's choices. And at the end of the day, this sort of life-changing pain really can just open us up into the depths of our hearts, can't it? And sometimes just leave us totally exposed and in pain. So to start, we need to look at the beginning. In order for us to gain like a biblical lens of how we view our pain and suffering, we have to look at where it started. And for some of you, this might be familiar. For others, it may not be. In Genesis chapter 2, when God had, had created everything and created Adam and Eve and everything was perfect, nothing was yet broken by sin, he gave them one rule. He's like, here's your one thing to not do. He says, 
of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So sure enough, we turn the page to chapter 3, and Adam and Eve go and they eat from the fruit. Now, when God says that in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, he didn't mean that you were just going to drop dead in the moment. He didn't mean that once you eat of it, you're going to start choking on it, and, and then there you go. We don't know the Heimlich maneuver yet, Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, so you're going to die. No, it wasn't that. It was what's happening is sin and death and suffering is now infused everything and every part of creation. And the word death doesn't just mean a one-time thing, but it's a continual cycle of death and suffering. This is where it all started. Now, if you're like me, one of your first reactions might be, well, thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. You went and had to screw it up for everybody else. But if I'm honest, and maybe if you're honest, if I was in that garden, I would have been eating the same fruit. And so here's the thing. When, when it comes to suffering, from the very beginning, we also know that it, that it stinks. Nobody likes it, right? I mean, nobody in their right mind likes pain. Nobody likes suffering. Nobody likes going through seasons where life is upside down. And so what we've done as a response or a reaction is we try to avoid it, don't we? We do everything in our power to try to avoid our pain and suffering. We do everything in our power to try to dull it or try to ignore it. Whatever we can do. I mean, think about how much time and energy and money and resources and effort we spend in gaining the creature comforts of life. I mean, think about how much we try to avoid inconveniences, take shortcuts in order to shave off a little bit of time so that we don't suffer, right? I mean, this is from the beginning of time. But sometimes trying to avoid suffering and pain actually makes it worse. When I was a kid, I grew up in this area where there are a few different lakes nearby, and, and fishing has always been one of my favorite pastimes. And so uh, I was a teenager, and one spring day, I thought, I'm going to go over to these ponds, take my belly boat, which if you're not sure what a belly boat is, it's just a fancy term for an inner tube with a cool seat in it and pockets all over to put all your fishing gear. And so sure enough, I got my belly boat and my waders and all my stuff, and I walked, had to walk up to this bridge in order to cross the river and then come back to the pond where I wanted to fish. It was about a half-mile walk or so. It wasn't bad. So I went and I fished all day, and afterwards I was ready to go home but I was tired, right? Tired. I was kicking around the lake all day. And so I, I had this really, really great idea. I thought, I'm just going to hop in the river with my belly boat and kick across. And then, and I'll save at least 10 minutes of walking, which is, was a huge win for me. Well, it was springtime, spring runoff. The, the river was maybe 10 times its normal size. And I thought, no big deal. I got a boat. This is what boats are for. So I go down to the river, and I, and I kind of put my belly boat, and I try to strap on my fishing rod, and, and, I, and then I, I just hop on top of the belly boat and try to start paddling across. Well, I quickly realized that I was no match for the current and the white water and all of that, and sure enough, I went overboard, and I, luckily, I grabbed my belly boat, right? Because I thought, man, I could die, or worse, I could lose all of my fishing gear <laughs> down the river. So here I am floating down the river with my arm in the belly boat. I reach out my other arm and I grab a big rock on the side of the bank. And there I am stuck. And my whole body's still in the water. And, and I have no idea how I'm going to get out. So I, t I take a moment and I kind of catch my breath and I calm down my brain for a second. And I, I'm able to throw my belly boat up onto the bank. And then I crawl myself back out and I think, oh my goodness, I made it. I can't believe I tried that, but hey, I'm alive. I didn't lose anything. But now I actually had to walk further because I was that much further down the river. You see, when we try to avoid suffering, sometimes it actually makes it worse. Thomas Merton says it this way, Indeed, the truth that many people never understand until it's too late is that the more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. The one who does most to avoid suffering is, in the end, the one who suffers the most. Have you experienced this to be true in your own life? 
You see, it's not that we should go out looking for it, but when it comes our way, when it flies out of left field, when your marriage ends abruptly, when your finances spring out of control, when that child makes a life-altering choice, when you get the report back from the doctor and all of it's out of left field, trying to avoid or dull the pain is just like an athlete who gets hurt out on the field, goes into the locker room, gets an injection in his knee, takes a couple of painkillers and goes back out on the field only to realize later that the damage is now irreparable. So what do we do? We know where it came from, that we live in a broken and sinful world. We know that we can't avoid it. So what is it that we do? How are we supposed to respond to our pain, our suffering, those things in life that just turn it upside down? We're going to be camping out for the whole series in this little part of one of, Paul, one of Paul's letters to the Corinthian church. And it's in his second letter, the second Corinthians chapter one. And we're going to be here every week for the next four weeks. And what I would encourage you to do is highlight this, write it down, uh, read it throughout the week, especially if you're in a season of suffering. Get these words into your heart, into your mind, and let the Holy Spirit of God speak to you through them. We're going to be revisiting them every week. And so to start this off, I'm going to read verses 3 through 11. It says this, <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is, to, our, our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. Verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. So here Paul makes a reference to something that he and his crew experienced when they were in Asia. All right? Did you catch that? He said, we were burdened beyond belief. We, we, were, we thought that life was over, that we had received the sentence of death. Now, have you ever been there where you thought, this is it? Like, that, that's got to be a scary place to be. If you've ever been there, you know what Paul's talking about here. When your life sort of flashes before your eyes, this is what was going on. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul is referring to in these verses. There's a few different theories about that. But what we do know for sure is that if anybody suffered, it was Paul. Later on in this same letter to the Corinthians, Paul gives us an idea of some of the suffering that he experienced. He says this, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. What this is, if you're not sure what that means, is they would strap someone to a post and they would whip them 39 times, thinking that on the 40th time that they would die because the pain was so bad. So they would take away one strike just so that they wouldn't die, so that they would continue to torture them. Five times Paul was beaten 39 times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Now this isn't Colorado stoned. This is like people picking up rocks and throwing them at your head until you die. And he survived. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers. I think that this involved a belly boat. I'm not sure. Danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, 
in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. You see, if anyone knew what suffering was like, it was Paul. And suffering, if you caught that list, came from all different things, other people, natural disasters, right? Maybe even choices from or or results of his own choices. And so if there's anyone we should listen to about suffering, it's him. And so as we look closer to these verses in 2 Corinthians, uh, we're going to look at three lies that we believe about suffering. Maybe you don't, but I see these often in people that I talk with. And my encouragement to you is this, is that if you believe these lies, it's only going to add more confusion and doubt to your life. However, however, if you notice and reject these lies, then you will be able to actually lean into and see some of the purpose of the pain and suffering that it plays in our lives. And so the first lie is this. It's what I call the karma mindset. The karma mindset is that you get what you deserve. Now, this might be true. If I go driving down the highway, down I-25 on a snowy night, and I'm going 120 miles an hour, I might get something that I deserve, a direct result from my choice. I'm going to be suffering in some way from my actions. And let's say I do. I spin out, and I end up in the hospital for a long time. Guess who was also suffering, but it wasn't their choice? My family my friends, my church. You see, there's some consequences that are related to our own choices, and there's others that that we have no control over. But here's the thing, is if, if you have this mindset, this karma mindset that you get what you deserve, here's how that plays out. It plays out in questions like this. Man, I served Jesus for years. Why did he let this happen to me? Do you see it? Man, I went to church every Sunday. Why in the world did Jesus let this happen to me? Man, I've been following him. I've been serving him. This isn't how it was supposed to go. God didn't hold up his end of the deal. Or it can be the flip side of that same coin, and you could, you could live your life in fear going, man, I cheated on my math test 20 years ago, and I knew that God was just waiting for that moment to get back at me, right? And then when something happens, we're like, oh, there it is. God is just this angry God waiting to to push the button, the smite button, there it is. You see, this is how this lie begins to intertwine itself into our thinking. But when we look at scripture, that's not how it works. Because Jesus actually promised us in John 16, he was talking to his disciples, he says, in this world you will have trouble. And if there's anybody who was living rightly, it was the disciples, but every one of them died because of their faith. Most of them died painful deaths because of their faith. And it wasn't because they were doing anything wrong. I mean, these guys were the movers and the shakers in the world when it came to the church. They were the ones planting churches and going and and preaching to thousands and thousands upon thousands coming to Christ. And they suffered and died because of it. You see, Jesus himself suffered and died. If anybody didn't deserve it, it was him. And so when you find this lie creeping up, when you begin to think, man, why did God allow this to happen? Because I've been serving him. He owes me more. I've earned something different. Just remind yourself of the words that Jesus said, that in this world you will have trouble. But then he goes on, but I have overcome the world. So don't buy into that lie. The second lie that I see often is is this lie that suffering is meaningless that we treat it like we treat it when we get a bad cold or COVID or whatever, that we just got to hunker down and just wait until it's over. 
That when suffering, when pain, when issues come our way, that, that we take everything that we were planning on, all the things that God was up to, all the other stuff that we had our minds on, that we just put that all aside and it's like, okay, now I got to deal with this. And then when this is over, then I can finally get back to my real life, my routines, my goals, what God is doing, all that sort of stuff. It, it, we're, we view it as a setback, that it's this meaningless hurdle in life. And that we should just avoid it at all costs. But Paul, again, in another letter, says this about suffering in his letter to the Romans. He says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. What kind of crazy talk is this? Knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance. And endurance produces what? Real loud. And character produces what? And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, my friends, when we see our suffering as just hurdles to get over, we actually miss out on something that God is wanting to do in us. That it doesn't have to be meaningless. And because of what he's done, it, it isn't meaningless. That there's actually work that God is doing in us as he is forming us and, and shaping us that can only happen in seasons of pain. Judith Haugen in her book, Transformed into Fire, says it this way. Our painful moments can become a crucible through which Christ in us is formed. Rather than evidence of a failed relationship with God, this speaks to the previous lie, pain can deepen relationship by revealing God from new angles. Have you ever experienced that? Man, there's things about God we get to experience in our pain that we cannot experience in any other season of life. And I talk to people now and then who look back on incredibly challenging seasons and they're like, man, it was the hardest thing ever. And I didn't actually see anything about what God was doing in the moment. But looking back on that now, I can see what God was up to and I can see how he was using it for his glory and for my good. And man, the closeness that came as a result of that, the closeness that I have with, with God, I would never change it for the world. And it just blows my mind. You're telling me you wouldn't change what you went through because of the closeness with God? And they're like, yeah, wouldn't change it. You see, our pain invites us into new experiences with God. But in the moment, God feels absent, doesn't he? He feels absent. He feels like he's forgotten you. He feels like he's not doing anything, like he's not up to anything. And that's probably going to be the experience. But it's going to be something that you can look back on years from now and look back on and say, man, I can see how God was working. And so instead of us trying to avoid it, or trying to medicate it, or trying to ignore our pain, what would it look like for us to lean into our pain? What would it look like for us to lean into it and go, God, what is it that you want, us, want me to know or to experience? Or what is it that you are wanting to do in me? One of the most meaningful ways to do this and the most productive way is to just simply talk with someone who is going to listen they're not going to judge you. They're not going to give you advice and try to fix you. You might be thinking, well, gosh, that sounds great. I just don't know of anybody who does that. That's exactly the reason why four years ago we started a ministry here called Stephen Ministry. Over the last four years, we've trained over 50 people as Stephen ministers. This week, we actually just commissioned 11 new Stephen ministers. We got a picture of our commissioning with them on Thursday night. There's Pastor Rick anointing with oil as we prayed over them as the Spirit of God leads them in their caring ministry. We're super excited for these new 11. And if you're wondering, well, what is it? I don't get it. What is it? It's real simple. Stephen ministry is one-on-one, Christ-centered, confidential, long-term care. Stephen ministers are trained to go along with you one-on-one, 
through a season of pain, whatever it might be, whether it's divorce or job loss or grief or whatever it is that's turned your world upside down, maybe a Stephen minister is what you need to walk through this season. And again, it's designed to be long-term. Some of our care relationships have lasted two months. Some of them have lasted up to four, almost four years, coming up on four years with our longest care relationship. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you're hearing this and you're like, gosh, I want to do that. Well, I'm excited because we're starting right now, we're starting to take applications for our new training coming up in September. If maybe you're hearing the Lord nudge you, maybe you have a gift of listening, maybe you have a, a gift of compassion, of mercy, and you want to learn what it means to be a Stephen minister, maybe you should check that out. We'd love for you to join us. There's information online at... Uh, the website there, slash Stephen Ministry. You can scan the QR code if that's your thing. You can stop at the table in, in the lobby on your way out. We'd love for you to find out more about Stephen Ministry. But maybe for some of you, leaning into the pain means getting a trusted Stephen Minister to walk with you through that. And then finally, the third lie that I see often is this, is that God doesn't give you more than you can handle. You ever heard that? You see, this is one of the most untrue statements that you could say. And it comes from a good place. We try to encourage people. You see, not only are we uncomfortable with our own pain, but we're uncomfortable with other people's pain. So when someone comes to us who's hurting, we don't know what to do with it. So we say things like, well, God doesn't give you more than you can handle, which actually isn't in Scripture. It's actually a twist on a different verse that Paul's talking about temptation, something totally different, where God helps us in our temptation. It has nothing to do with, with this. And actually, it's probably the least helpful thing that you could hear in your season of pain, isn't it? Right? Because you're going through whatever it is, and your soul is just being pulverized day in and day out, and then someone comes to you and says, you know, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And what happens when you realize, well, that's not true for me. Maybe I'm a failure. Maybe I'm not strong enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I really do just deserve all this crap that's flowing my way. And shame begins to creep in and take up residence in our hearts. Earlier in verse 9, Paul speaks to this lie. He says this, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And here it is, listen. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. He says it right there. And that's, that's good news for us, is that we don't have to rely on ourselves anymore, but on God. And you see, if you've ever had a root canal, you know what I'm talking about. Right? When I've had a root canal and my face swells up this big and I can't talk and the pain, I mean, quickly I realize I cannot handle this. I can't do anything on my own. I'm not about to pull a Tom Hanks and stick an ice skate in my mouth, right? I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I need someone else's help. I can't rely on myself. That's what Paul's talking about here. This idea that the pain and hardship that we're in it's to remind us that we don't have to rely on ourselves, that we get to rely on God, that it's no longer about you having to be strong enough or good enough or together enough or whatever it is enough. And I hope that you, when you hear these words, for some of you, that this is a breath of fresh air, maybe even permission to not have it all together right now. You've been trying because you know or you, you thought you believe this lie, and you've been striving really hard, and I just want you to know that it's okay to not have it together. It's okay to not be able to rely on yourself, because this is an invitation to rely on God. And again, sometimes that looks like trusting or talking with a trusted friend or Stephen minister or counselor or whatever that might be. Other times it's in the stillness and the quiet when it's just you and God and God begins to whisper to your soul life-giving words. And you begin to see your reliance and your trust in him begin to strengthen. 
And when we're invited to trust and rely on God, it's not on just some wimpy God, but here it is again in verse 9, but on a God who raises the dead. I mean, who does this? Why in the world would we rely on ourselves when we can rely on a God who raises the dead? Why would I rely on anything that I can produce when the God who's part of his attributes is that he is a God who resurrects life and we are invited into relying on him? And so here's the thing, even if my suffering ends up killing me, guess what? My God raises the dead. Even if my suffering takes me out, my God raises the dead. But you know, it's not just something that happens in the future. It's not only something we get to look forward to, that one day those who are in Christ will be resurrected with him, that we will be raised, given new bodies with him, we will be raised from the dead. But guess what? It happens now, too. What are those parts of you that have died? What are those parts of your heart, your soul, your mind that have died? It died when your spouse died or your child died. It died when those dreams died. It died when the regret is just a huge mountain. What are those parts of you that have died? And perhaps God is inviting you into a new place where he wants to resurrect some of those areas of your life. So we know that suffering is unavoidable. We can't buy the lie of the karma mindset. We know that suffering can be meaningful that he's working in us. And we know that suffering is an invitation to rely on the God who raises the dead. Charles Spurgeon says it this way in his quote, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the God who raises the dead. And when we think about it, it's like, how can this be? How can this be that God can make meaning in our pain and that we can rely on this God who raises the dead? The only reason this is true and can be is because Jesus suffered first. He suffered for you and for me. And he resurrected. That's who our God is. So I'm going to say a prayer. And then we are going to remember his sacrifice by taking communion together. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you thanks for this time. Thank you that you are a God who raises the dead. Thank you that you're not a a God that just needs to be appeased. That you're not a God that we have to tiptoe around. But that you are a God who resurrects new life. So for those of us who are going through incredible pain right now, God, my prayer is that you would woo them deeper into your presence. God, that you would use it as a a way to form them more into the image of your son. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you're with us in our pain. God, thank you that you empathize with our pain. Thank you that you will never, ever leave us in our pain. We trust you, and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. You know what, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if maybe for the first time you've decided to rely on God, we'd love to walk with you in that. We'd love to talk with you about what that means. You can simply text the name Jesus to the number on, your, on the screen and someone will be in touch with you about that. Every week we take time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus because without this, everything else is, is meaningless. So Jesus, because of you and because of me, because of his love for you and for me, his body was broken and his blood was poured out. 
Let's remember together. In the cup. Friends, we're going to spend some time responding to God and his goodness by singing. If you would like someone to pray with you, we'd love to do that. We have people who are designated to pray with you right now. Also online, you can click the prayer button and someone will pray with you now. Would you stand together as we sing? Uh-huh.
out to the Lord this morning.
shout your praise today. We shout your praise. You're over all. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. I know. others that James was just talking about, we are here for you. So one way to get connected with us is if you're new, please text to the screen or to the number on the screen uh, that you're new. We want to know you. Um, we want to connect with you because we love. It's just what Jesus did. He's called us to love you. And that's one of the ways that we can do that. The other thing is, is if you um, are working through, hey, how do I get connected? What are my next steps? Uh, type next so we can work you through that process. And last, if you have any questions about that Jesus that we love, that we want to emulate and be more like, text the word Jesus so we can get you connected um, with Jesus and who he is and how much he loves you. All right. Thanks, Renee. Hey, friends, and all the lights and all this fancy stuff, really, this is just who we are today and our desire to create a space for us to draw near to God. Uh, throughout the week, uh, Crossroads is really a grassroots kind of ground level uh, organization that we are broken people that serve broken people and lead them to health. So if you're a financial partner with Crossroads in that, we wanna thank you for that. And if you would like to join with us in that, uh, we would love your participation uh, uh, with your time and energy and your resources. Uh, you can give online through the Crossroads website, through the Crossroads app, or if you're here in person like you guys are, uh, you can do it on your way out. All right, last step here. Um, if you want to put your hands out, I would just like to pray over you. So Isaiah uh, 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And the flames, they shall not consume you. So go with the God who is not consumed by fire or rivers, but he is standing there with you. Amen. Have a blessed day. Amen. Cheers. Have a great week. Nations bow, mountains shake. 